is it still going through trauma, are still rebuilding, and the government will continue to support them every step of the way. And I want to, in particular, again, thank all of our agencies, all of our volunteers, all those who continue to support our communities who are doing it tough. And of course, on top of the horrific bushfire season, we also have to contend with uh, the COVID-19 COVID um, crisis. Uh, what I will do now is, um, is briefly outline uh, the health statistics overnight. Dr Chant will give a health update. Minister Elliott will take you through the detail of some of the, the initiatives the government's already adopted in terms of our response to the bushfire inquiry. And of course, uh, former Commissioner Fitzsimmons, head of the RFS and now head of Resilience New South Wales, will be leading the government's response to adopting all of the recommendations. And of course, uh, new Commissioner Rogers is here to also address any questions regarding the RFS. Uh, and their response to the report. Um, pleasingly, in relation to COVID, we had three cases overnight, one of which was a returned overseas traveller. The other two were linked to known cases, and Dr Chant will give you further detail around that. But again, we want to maintain that the testing blitz. We're so pleased that so many people are coming forward to get tested. We need that to continue. And we will notice uh, in the next few weeks, at the very least, a yo-yo effect. Some days we'll have lower case numbers than others. Uh, but of course, uh, we are certainly in a much better position today than we were some weeks ago, and we want that situation to continue. But the key to that is coming forward and getting tested. The key to that is making sure that people feel comfortable in getting tested and staying home for 14 days when they're asked to do so. And the government will always look at ways in which we can support our communities to do that. And I do want to thank every individual that has come forward to get tested, because that means we are not only uh, able to be in a stronger position to control the virus, but also to control and understand uh, what the virus is doing in and around New South Wales. Uh, so I'll shortly ha hand over to, to Dr Chan. And before I do, I want to again reiterate that at this stage, New South Wales uh, has just commenced the new fire season. So the release of this report and our response is timely. Uh, having said that, we know our job is not done in recovering and rebuilding in the aftermath of those horrific bushfires. And our government has managed uh, to do a great job, led by the DP, the Deputy Premier in the recovery effort, where many um, homes, where many uh, properties lost, are, and many people who've lost their homes are in a position to rebuild. But we know for those who've lost loved ones, we know for those who are still bearing the scars of their injuries. Uh, the healing process is far from done. In fact, it will take a lifetime. And I just want to say that today um, and every other day, we think about all those who've experienced the trauma, who've experienced the pain and who are still uh, in recovery mode when it comes to dealing with that horrific bushfire season. So I'll now hand to Dr Chan and then hand over to Minister Elliott and then we'll take any of your questions. So there were three new cases of COVID were diagnosed in the 24 hours to 8 p.m. last night, bringing the total number of cases in New South Wales to 3,802. There were 10,375 tests reported in the 24 hour reporting period, and that lower number of tests reflects usually the pattern we see on weekends with lower numbers of people coming forward on the weekend, particularly on Sunday. Of the three new cases reported to 8 p.m. last night, one was a case was an overseas acquired and is in hotel quarantine, and two of the cases are contacts of previous cases. One of those cases is a healthcare worker at Liverpool Hospital, and they had been identified as a close contact of a previous case and were in self-isolation at the time of their infectious period. The other case is a student who attends Our Lady of Mercy College, Parramatta, and they had also been identified as a close contact of a previous case and were in self-isolation for their infectious period. There are currently 84 COVID cases being treated by New South Wales Health and seven are in, in intensive care, four are ventilated. At this time, it is essential that we ask for the community to continue to come forward for testing um, so co ha having any COVID symptoms, however minimal. Whilst our focus has been on South Western Sydney and Western Sydney, we still urge anyone across the state with symptoms to come forward. On our website, there is also areas of concerns where we would like increased testing listed, as well as venues or places where infectious people have been visited. So we would urge the community to regularly peruse that website and take action accordingly. Thank you. 
Thanks, Kerry. Can I just um, open by, um, on behalf of the Rural Fire Service and Fire and Rescue New South Wales, thank uh, Dave Owens and Mary O'Kane for what has been a comprehensive uh, inquiry into uh, the last summer's bushfire season. Um, by way of some statistics, uh, this was a six month inquiry, 1,967 uh, a recommend, uh, sorry, 1,967 uh, submissions were made by members of the public from a variety of backgrounds and demographics, from parliamentarians and other government departments to members of the public and indeed, as the Premier alluded to, victims of that tragic summer. Uh, we have already started implementing and acting on some of those 76 recommendations. Uh, we have, of course, uh, thrown another $45 million already uh, into the season that's uh, before us. Uh, that includes $10.7 million to uh, uh, retain an extra 100 um, firefighters who are responsible for mitigation work. Uh, we've already employed 94 of those 100. 120 vehicles have already been uh, in, uh, in, included into the uh, RFS orbit into their into their uh, uh, capabilities, and that uh, another 70 vehicles uh, will be uh, upgraded to ensure that they are fit for purpose. Uh, this recommendation, these 76 recommendations, are wide-ranging, uh, but what they also show is that there's no silver bullet. Uh, the last summer was caused by a crippling drought, seeing an increase in fuel loads. That's a matter of public record. Uh, what we also know is that the vast majority of these fires were started by lightning strikes. Uh, and of course that's not something uh, that a government, no matter how hard we work, uh, can prepare for. But what we can do is prepare our communities and our combat agencies to ensure that if we do find uh, that we face ourselves before uh, another firefighting season that we've just seen, that we are in the best place position. Uh, and that includes, as a result of these recommendations, a much stronger focus on aviation assets. Uh, those aviation assets uh, will be now deployed in the evening at night time. Those aviation assets will also uh, ensure that whatever is available around the world is considered. Uh, we're also looking at the welfare of our firefighters. Uh, 70,000 firefighters put themselves uh, at risk or have certainly volunteered themselves available. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, because the RFS in New South Wales is the largest firefighting service in the world, it is also seen as the world's best practice. Uh, a, a number of other recommendations which I know certain sections of the community will be concerned about, our uh, ability to uh, deal with native fauna uh, when, it, when we see animals that have been injured as a result of bushfires, uh, mental health of those, those firefighters so that we don't um, see them slip by the wayside and they become, even though they've had a difficult season, they continue to be wonderful assets to the people of New South Wales and, and, and be fit for purpose when it comes to the capabilities that we offer in the Rural Fire Service. Uh, we are prepared for the next season. What we're not prepared for, of course, is the unknown. I think what we see out of these 76 recommendations is going to sharpen up our ability to prepare for the unknown. I think what we see from these 76 recommendations uh, is, uh, is a fire service that has been fit for purpose. Uh, there certainly was not any real criticism of the way that we approached the last season, uh, but we also want to make sure that uh, uh, given uh, this may or may not be something that we see again in our lifetime, we don't, we don't as a community have to face the level of anxiety that we did in the last bushfire season. Um, with that, I'm very happy to take any questions or the Premier or either of the Commissioners. Sorry? What do you mean by strategic hazard reduction burn? Or the strategic hazard burn? I might. Do you want to take that one? Strategic hazard reduction burns are very much by nature looking at something from a strategic sense. They're not right against the properties, they're more uh, remote, but they're normally in areas that are either a fire path. Or, or a little bit closer to property, so they provide that little bit lower fuel load as fires go through either a uh, funnelling area to go towards properties or indeed before you get to an asset protection zone. So they're very much there looking at previous fire paths, making sure we put targeted burns in place to consider the past fire history. How much more power will landowners have? I'm sorry? How much more power will landowners have? Well, landowners. 
well, landowners obviously have rights on their land as it is. They also have obligations. There's obligations under Section 63 of the Rural Fires Act to say you need to act to make sure fire doesn't leave your uh, property and interfere with another property. So they have those obligations. Whether people do their own burns, obviously we would have to be satisfied that they're able to do them safely. Um, but look, rural landholders have been doing those sort of burns for many years and we see that continuing. Well, I think what the Minister's talking about there is, is really about us doing things like nighttime firefighting, so becoming more active at night when fires are, are lower in intensity and making sure we take opportunities. Whenever the fires are the best to firefight, we do that. Also looking at um, our ability to insert firefighters uh, after dark where these fires, again, are fairly uh, small and our ability to actually get these fires under control and making sure that it's done in a very coordinated way. Well, no, look, the government's already purchased additional aircraft. We've got the only large air tanker in the entire country that's owned by a government and is here 365 days of the year. So we have that. We've already got helicopters. There's two more helicopters coming for this fire season. Um, we've also got two other smaller jets that are we doing mapping of fires. Uh, they'll come online this fire season. So government's already invested significant funds to make sure we're better prepared for future fire seasons. Well, I, I couldn't see anything that laid blame on any individual. As I said, there was no silver bullet, but if you're asking his Cabinet, um, uh, and indeed is the RFS, keen to make sure fuel loads do not build up again, the answer is a hearty yes. That was very much um, the view of, uh, of, the, of the Cabinet. It's very much the view of, of myself. Uh, the Premier has told me that I, I'm not restricted to those 76 recommendations. She's given me uh, permission to go beyond those 76 recommendations, and if fuel loads uh, are seen as being um, something that we need to focus on more sharply, then I'll certainly do that. Well, that's obviously in place at the moment, but I'm not married to any particular figure. Um, uh, I will allow my Cabinet colleagues to have that discussion. It's a matter of public record that there's a variety of views uh, in the government about uh, how far these asset protection zones should be, how, how wide um, uh, those, uh, those restrictions should apply to, or that, that freedom to, to backburn should apply to. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be dispassionate, as I'm sure the Premier will be. We want to make sure that we get the balance right. And to do that, we've got to make sure we, take, we consider um, both the concerns of those that uh, are advocates of the environment, but also um, our main concern. Uh, it will always be. My main concern is, and I need this made very, very clear, is life and property. Everything that we do with these 76 recommendations will be focused on protecting life and property. Uh, James? Well, we already have some restrictions in that regard, and of course, yes, that is something that will be considered because we want to. This is all about making sure we mitigate the risk and we protect life and property. If to protect life and property, we have to introduce anything above and beyond these 76 recommendations. Well, that's something the cabinet will consider. Oh, Matt, I'm so, I'm really sorry. I can't hear you. Well, that's a matter that will that's a matter that will be before the cabinet. Yeah. All, all, all I'm really in a position to say in regards to that is that the 76 recommendations have been acknowledged and supported by government. Beyond that will be a matter of cab for Cabinet. The Premier has given me a six-week timetable to make sure that um, the, how we roll those things out. Remember, some of these recommendations are going to require um, negotiation with the Commonwealth. Some of these recommendations are going to have significant budgetary ex um, issues to, uh, for me to address. Some of them are already being implemented. Um, so there are a variety of um, issues that we now have to, uh, to, to, to move on to make sure that those 76 recommendations are indeed implemented. Beyond 10 hectares. Well, 
I'm, I'm, that, that's an important KPI, and I think that in, in, in modern management terms, KPIs are there so that people know that we accept them and uh, we accept the obligations and, and the ambitions of an organisation. But I want to make it very clear, the KPI for the Commissioner and I in any bushfire is to get it out as soon as possible. Unless, of course, it's strategically important for us to manage it so that it protects other life and property in, in, that, in, in the event that we either do back burning or that it's a strategic burn. But um, let's not get too focused on KPIs because my KPI every time I come into this room is to make sure that the Commissioner has got whatever assets and, the, and support that he has to get a fire out immediately. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not going to speculate on what ministers are upset. Last season, you were no higher than the average in the last 30 years. If fuel loads were no higher than normal, why is so much attention being given to gas reduction as a kind of panacea? Uh, in terms of reducing the well, I might ask the Commissioner answer that, but before I ask, offer that to him, just remember that, as I've said, there is no silver bullet in, in this. This was, any, every, it's a matter of public record again that there was, we've had a prolonged period of drought. It's a matter of public record that um, this was caused by an, um, an unusually high level of lightning strikes, but I might invite the Commissioner to I think it's fair to say that hazard reduction is an important thing we need to do and we need to do it targeted and we need to make sure we do it in the right spot and I think the report actually does talk about that. So hazard reduction isn't the only solution but it's, it's, it's certainly part of the solution and we need to get that right. There's also community expectations when it comes to hazard reduction, making sure that we're doing what the community expects, where the community expects in the time the community expects. So I think that's very much what drives what we do, what locally the focus of hazard reduction is, um, and I think that what we've got to do is build on the successes of the past and make sure we do a, a better job even in future. It's been you know, the best part of nine months since the worst of the fire season. There's still people living in shipping containers down the south coast. Is, is that acceptable? Well, I just want to make clear that we have uh, assisted in, in thousands of homes being cleaned up and uh, the last report I received was that that was a small number of very complex cases that were left and we're obviously working through that. We always knew the recovery would take time. Uh, unfortunately when you have a disaster of the scale that we've witnessed in our state uh, we have to assume that it takes time for us to get to a position where everybody feels they're in a position to rebuild, where every single person feels uh, they've been taken care of, and we accept that. And that's why, I'm sorry, well, I don't know about that, but I, what I do know is that literally thousands and thousands of people have received relief in terms of having their clean-up costs completely met, having uh, their clean-up completely done by the state government, and we actually took that upon ourselves to do that. Um, I understand there are a small number of cases which are very complex, which we're still working through. Uh, and, uh, and, but, I, but in the main, um, when I visited communities and the reports I've received, is that uh, we actually did better than we thought in terms of the targets we'd set for ourselves and how many properties would clean up in a particular time. And I want to thank all those who partnered with the government in, in, in that regard. But we know that the scars of this season will go on for a long time. We're not going to pretend uh, that we have managed to firstly deal with all the physical issues and secondly, of course, the ongoing trauma of those directly impacted. And uh, of course, those who've lost loved ones, those who bear physical scars, but also those who've just been traumatised by what they saw, uh, will linger for many years. And uh, that's why the government is, is there to continue to support those communities, but I also appreciate very much that there is a sense of urgency that the next fire season is already upon us. So the government has taken every action we can already in response to the recommendations that we received. Some of them will take a bit longer, but uh, I have tasked the Minister to coordinate uh, the views uh, of, of the government in terms of how we can expedite some of those things. And of course, Commissioner Fitzsimmons, as head of uh, New Zealand's Resilience New South Wales, is in charge of making sure all of our government agencies respond in the quickest and most efficient way possible to ensure that those uh, in the community uh, who are still living in those regions that could face a bushfire risk don't have the angst 
uh, don't have the angst, but rather have the relief that our government, their government, is doing everything we can to prevent uh, that season again. We do have to also expect, accept that in addition to the issues that have been canvassed this morning, our climate is changing. And those who wrote the report actually acknowledge that our climate is changing. And as Commissioner Fitzsimmons and Commissioner Rogers will attest, uh, some of those morning briefings I received from them, they would tell me examples of things they'd seen which they'd never seen before in decades of fighting fires. And we have to accept that as well. So yes, there are these legacy issues that we deal with every time there's a fire season, but we also have to accept that there were unprecedented conditions, uh, coupled with the drought, coupled with um, some fuel loads in some areas, uh, but moreover, that the climate is changing and we have to ex expect and accept that part of the ferocity of what we saw was a combination of all of those things. And our government is working as hard as we can, as fast as we can and as efficiently as we can to resource up our agencies, but also to do everything we can to mitigate the risk. There are some risks we can definitely mitigate, but we also need the community's support and the community's help. And whilst we always remember the loved ones that were lost, the three local firefighters and the overseas firefighters that were lost and their families that are still going through the pain and anguish, we also have to remember the thousands of lives saved, the thousands of properties saved. And if it weren't for the two gentlemen here in the agencies and the volunteers and workers across the state from all of our combat agencies, uh, we would have looked down a far more bleak picture. And I can't tell you how much I appreciated their efforts to actually protect life and protect property. And that is what the recommendations of this report uh, now give us the power to do in a forceful, vigilant, and quick way. How much will it cost you to at least 76 recommendations and how much are you putting aside? Well, obviously, um, not all of the recommendations require additional resourcing. Some are policy changes, which we're go working our way through. Some have already been implemented. But as uh, Commissioner Rogers already highlighted, we've already provided additional resourcing since the last season in relation to additional assets, in relation to additional uh, uh, items that the RFS needs. So we have already made an excess of $45 million, I think is the, is the figure, uh, since the last fire season on top of uh, the record investments in previous years. In fact, I, re I remember the decision to build this centre here and how we were promised it would be state of the art and would help us fire bushfires. Well, that's one of the best decisions we made, frankly, because this state of the art facility not only now is helping us prepare for the next fire season, but also preparing our state to be resilient against the biggest challenge we've faced in more than a century. About the capability of the medium sized super scoopers, the CL 416s, are you going to look at investing in those given their agility and their ability to get to fires in remote areas very quickly? I'll ask the experts to answer that. So maybe Commissioner Rogers or, and then, yep. Um, aviation is something that's come of age when it comes to firefighting. Uh, we've certainly seen it over the course of the last 25 years with the uh, uh, with the helicopters that had been originally brought in. But of course, what we have seen uh, in New South Wales is and we've embraced it. When we talk about those military tactics, that's all about making sure aviation assets can fly over a fire ground quickly, early, uh, with a maximum amount of retardant and water to drop on it. Uh, we've seen with the Marie Bashir that was worked uh, and deployed very well over the course of this season, uh, and it could be, re re um, it could be uh, refilled within minutes. Uh, now, um, that turned out to be the best money this government's ever spent, I think, when it comes to emergency services. Uh, the scooper that you're referring to has already been trialled in New South Wales. Uh, it does have limitations. It's not as big as the Mari Bashir. Uh, but uh, as I've already said, uh, on the back of these recommendations, uh, and given that the technology and the capability and the resources that are available to uh, the RFS at the moment when it comes to aviation, given the added benefit that aviation assets give us when it comes to um, not only deploying firefighters at short notice to remote areas, but also gathering intelligence, um, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for it, but I will always obviously have to act on the advice of the commanders. Uh, they're the ones with the operational expertise, and I'll in invite one of them to come and say something about that now. Now, apparently, I've given the perfect answer. Yeah. The C-130 is already being deployed. And also, trucks or like halos. Yep. Extra uniforms. Uh, PPEs, yeah. Um, of those kinds of 
uh, changes, are you going to need more than forty five million dollars? Absolutely. Uh, how much? Well, um, a lot of them do, uh, re require a business case. Uh, I've already had a meeting with the with the treasurer about that. Uh, so I will be taking some significant uh, matters to uh, uh, to not only discuss with him before the budget, but when the budget's handed out. Some of them can't be can't be delayed to the budget, and I'll be working with the treasurer um, under the timetable the premier has already set me. Say again. You still have to harvest money. Oh. <laughs> There. Premier, COVID, there. I'll just quickly, on security guards at hotel quarantine, um, is it time to do away with them given what we've seen in the last couple uh, of days? The police advised me on a daily basis. Um, in fact, uh, we canvassed uh, many of those issues this morning and the police uh, have every confidence in the system. We've now officially ticked over 50,000 people coming back, which is a key milestone. That's huge by anybody's standards, by anybody's efforts. If we ever need to change or do more, we will. Uh, but I feel I have the best advice available to me, and the best advice available to me is that our processes are sound. But as I said yesterday, and as I've, as I've said previously, whilst we know the processes are sound, whilst we know the audits uh, occur on a daily basis to make sure everybody's doing the right thing, it would be unrealistic and, and dishonest for me to suggest that there'll be 100% of compliance 100% of the time every single day. And no system is foolproof. We've seen that already when it comes to our borders, whether they're international borders or borders between states. Uh, we know what the processes need to be. We have them. We have the best people onto them, but we also appreciate that human error and complacency can creep in. And that's why we have to maintain our vigilance. I want to thank the police in particular for overseeing the process. We have ADF, ABF, we have federal agencies and state government agencies working together. And uh, if I receive any advice that we need to change anything at any stage, I will be more than pleased to do that because that is our job, is to listen to the experts, to listen to those who I believe have managed a system very well to date. I mean, to have welcomed 50,000 people and until recently not really had any issue is a testimony, I think, to uh, all those agencies working together and I was also heartened by the audit that the federal government conducted um, independently uh, but to some of the states. Uh, New South Wales was one of the states that got audited recently and that gave me an additional degree of confidence that what we have in place is sound, especially compared to what is occurring in other states. Um, but of course, we are always open to improvements. If the police advise me that uh, we need to make tweaks or change, or if health makes those, um, those observations and, and gives that advice, of course we will do that. Uh, but I do rely on the experts. I have every confidence in them. And, uh, and uh, it's an ongoing brief. The health advice, the police advice is always evolving. Uh, but our government is ready and willing to make any changes we need to to continue to make the community as safe as possible, but also to keep people, obviously, in the broader community, living as freely as possible, going about their daily business. We know that all of us um, have to act a certain way whilst the pandemic is here. Life won't be normal until there's a vaccine. But I also appreciate in New South Wales, and I'm very grateful that people are getting on with their business, are getting on with their lives, and that's the healthy balance we need to continue to strike. Well, obviously, as police have said in the last few days, they are constantly auditing processes, constantly making sure everybody is doing the right thing at all times. Uh, and and uh, that's that's uh, a daily brief. It's it's you have to be vigilant every single day. And as Dr. Chant knows, with the ex expert health traces, as uh, Deputy Commissioner Warboys knows, um, in the police logistics and compliance, every day is a battle against the disease. No day is easy. Yes, we might come here and rattle off the numbers on a daily basis, but every day is a battle. Every day requires enormous effort and coordination across whole of government and uh, as I said if there's any advice or evidence that we need to change anything we're doing I think part of the success in New South Wales has been because we're flexible and nimble we've responded as we've learnt more about the virus we've responded as the pandemic has evolved we've responded as the community's um, movements have changed and our behaviour has changed and uh, that is an evolving brief uh, we are always looking at ways in which we can improve our response 
and deal with it. Uh, but to date, if you look at the results in New South Wales, if you look at the balance we've struck between people's ability to work and get on with their lives and controlling the virus, I think you would agree generally that uh, we have managed that balance, but it is a daily battle and we are far from perfect. In fact, mistakes have been made and will be made. We have to accept that a pandemic, uh, unfortunately, is unpredictable. It relies on everybody doing everything right 100% of the time. And it's extremely challenging, extremely challenging. We have evidence of people aboard coming ashore at least twice near Yamba. How were they allowed to do this? And why was the Lady Pamela and its crew given the exemption to enter New South Wales two days after leaving? Oh, look, I'm not sure of the, the details of that. They're, they're the first details I've had of that. But um, suffice to say that I want to thank the police for getting on top of anyone who is trying to game the system or trying to conduct activity they shouldn't be doing. And uh, if you provide those details, we'll make sure the police um, follow up because we don't want anybody. This is the challenge we have, unfortunately. And it's a very, very small percentage of people. I don't know about the circumstances of that case. So I don't want to cast aspersions on anybody. But unfortunately, there is always a small proportion of people who try and game the system, who try and get through some of the loopholes that might exist. And it's our job, it's the police's job to get on top of that. So if there are any things brought to our attention, which we feel people are taking advantage of what is otherwise a difficult situation, well, of course, uh, the police and the compliance authorities will get on top of that. Yeah, I'm sorry? Sorry, given the mistakes here in terms of the security company and the apparent mistakes should we even be using unified security? Well, that is um, the advice. The advice I've received, the latest advice I've received from police uh, and our authorities, is that the system we have should remain and is sound. And if I get any advice to the contrary, of course we'll act. But that is as late as this morning. That is that is the latest advice I received. What COVID training given before they start work in? Hotel yeah, I'll have to get that advice from the police, but obviously the police would oversee that process. Required training in COVID nineteen Well, clearly, well, clearly, I know, I know that uh, of course everybody who works in and around the system, and there are many, many authorities, federal agencies, state government agencies, private agencies. Uh, there are numerous authorities that work in and around the system. All of them have obviously received uh, the training they are required to have in order to conduct their jobs. But we also have to make sure that we are constantly auditing this because it's one thing to be trained, but it's one thing also to make sure you're applying that every minute that you're in your job. And that's why the police conduct numerous audits. And if there are any systemic issues, of course, we'll deal with them. However, the latest advice I have as late as this morning is that the processes and the system is sound and uh, the police will continue to monitor that. But if I ever got advice to the contrary, ever, of course we'd act. That's our job, to listen to the experts and then to respond. Come in, like, two or three problems. I mean, that's pretty good. Oh, look, right? that, that's for others to comment on. I'm here to answer your questions. <laughs> yeah, look, I think it's fair to say that given we've welcomed back 50,000 people and again, uh, please know that this is on behalf of our nation. Other states haven't stepped up and taken as many overseas travellers as Sydney has. And with Melbourne out of action, we are bearing the overwhelming majority of people, Australians, coming back to Australia. Some do have hardship and terrible circumstances, which has required them to come back. Others have different reasons. Uh, and, uh, and again, we are doing this on behalf of the nation because other states, frankly, aren't upping how many people they're accepting every, every day. And in fact, New South Wales is doing more than double all the other states combined, from what I understand. We're doing at least two and a half to 3,000 out of the national 4,000 a day. Uh, and uh, it's a big job. Oh, sorry, a week, I think, um, not a day. We're doing 350 a day. Uh, it is a big job. And uh, we've stepped up because we know it's in our state's interests. Uh, and uh, we are also bound by rules that, that, um, that aren't just born upon in New South Wales and we have to accept that. But um, I want to thank everybody who's been involved in the system to date, 50,000 people coming back. 
I think by the time Melbourne had has shut its doors, that they'd done 20,000. So it just goes to show how much we've done compared to all the other states. 就是视频的翻译功能，这个功能非常适合经常观看美剧或者其他非中文语言类视频的朋友。如果你的英语水平不是特别好的话，那么使用这个翻译功能就非常的方便了。它可以在线将影片中的这个英文对白字幕翻译成中文字幕，因为 YouTube 具备了非常强大的这种翻译功能，不管视频是什么语言的字幕，它都可以在线翻译成适合你的语言。但是使用这个功能的前提是，你所观看的视频开启了这个 CC 字幕。我们现在找一个视频给大家演示一下。我们先点击视频右下方的这个 CC 字幕按钮，视频就会显示对方所上传的这个 CC 字幕。现在它这个视频显示的是英文字幕，我们给它翻译成适合我们的观看字幕。比如说，我这边点击设置按钮里面的字幕。然后选择下面的这个自动翻译，它里面几乎涵盖了世界上全部主流的语言。比如这里我选择中文简体，这样视频里就会出现中文。